Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and I'm going to tell you about the MiGs landing in the 727 and tell you some little-known facts about it. Now, one of them is kind of discussed on the video I'm going to show here in a moment. But we used to have a, a field near Chicago called MiGs Field. I've flown in there in my little airplane several times. In fact, the last time I flew in there was Photo Chase on the Boeing 247 when it made its trip to Chicago. Now, this was a lovely airport. My son's flown in there. It's close into uh, Chicago, and you could actually fly in there. The landing fees were kind of high. You'd expect that, but you could fly in there, and you could actually walk to downtown. It was so close. I mean, uh, there are very few cities that have an airfield like there, like that. And this is a picture of it. Just absolutely gorgeous airfield out there. But I hate to say it was the victim of a terrorist attack. Yes, yes, a terrorist attack. This field was destroyed late one night. Heavy equipment was brought in and the runway uh, was carved up so it was unusable. Now this was a, a real good political thing because there was a doctor's convention there at the time and uh, it's kind of hard to see but there you might think it was a bonanza convention but no it was a doctor's convention kind of the same thing. I think a bunch of cardiologists and uh, they kind of got their airplane stuck there because the runway is destroyed. Well they finally got approval to uh, take off essentially on the taxiway otherwise there was a, a good number of airplanes that are going to be stuck there. So what do we have now there we have this park that you can see is just everybody loves it you can see how crowded it is yeah it was supposed to be dedicated i think to the mayor's wife well like i said terrorist activity in the united states the only civilian airfield that was destroyed after 9 11 so think about that a little bit i mean this is kind of ridiculous there's a lot of pilots who really miss this airfield now let's let's take a look at the look at the video and finally it's time to lower the flaps and the landing gear for the last time it's a super short runway about half as long as o'hare's shortest jet runways so captain thomas what did you do to practice for this <laughs> i didn't practice for it you didn't actually go out and fly this particular airplane for well, I, I am current in the 727, but as yeah. far as making short field landings, no, we don't, we don't practice that. The winds at Meg's can be very tricky. Today, they were only about 12 miles an hour, but gusty. Captain Thomas makes minor adjustments for the wind. He slows the airplane down to a crawl, about 115 miles an hour. He later says he was aiming to land about 50 feet from the approach edge of the runway. Now, some landings are obviously better than other landings, but, you know, the old adage, any landing you can walk away from. Some landings are the result of very unfortunate circumstances, and in some respects, they end up uh, actually coming out very well, given the conditions, because uh, uh, if the loss to thrust on British Airways 777 had occurred a little bit earlier, it could have been very bad. Now, every United pilot knows about Kmart in Salt Lake City. This was early on in the 727 when a lot of fixed-wing pilots were not that aware of some bad characteristics that could develop with swept-wing aircraft and high rate of descent. And then there are type of the landings that, you know, you just don't have a choice, and it's amazing that nobody died in the miracle on the Hudson. Absolutely uh, miraculous. The, of course, the airplane um, never went back into service. You wouldn't expect that, but everybody survived. So that's another good landing uh, that uh, everybody uh, could float away from. Now, sometimes you just want to get the airplane on the ground. You know, it, things aren't going well. It's not your day. You need to get it back. So, um, you know, you get the airplane ready, you come in and land. And uh, in that case, people are just happy to get back on the ground. That's one of those landings that everybody is, hey, we're on the ground. We're happy. Uh, that's fine. Uh, there are other type of landings where ah, things go wrong at the last minute. This, this is an aircraft I was actually looking uh, to buy at one time. I had flight... Uh, 
uh, flown this aircraft, uh, thinking about buying it. And uh, the, uh, I guess there was a little uh, issue with rebuilding the uh, Kenner engine there. And um, uh, it, uh, it uh, ended up landing due to an engine failure in a golf course. But again, uh, the pilot, very noted and famous pilot was able to walk away because the main thing is you don't want to embarrass yourself you don't want to become one of these uh harried animals here uh that is just not a, a good way to uh to end a uh, flying career or a landing but let's talk about let's talk about bc thomas here now first of all um i uh i've got 11 years on the 727, about 8,000 hours, and I was an instructor on it. And uh, so so I've got a reasonable amount of time here and quite a bit of time doing flaps 40 landings. We had two basic flap landing settings, flaps 30 and flaps 40, and due to uh, the whole situation with uh, uh, noise abatement and fuel savings, uh, they favored the flaps 30. But B.C. Thomas was an Air Force pilot for 22 years, and he graduated from the uh, Air Force Test Pilot School, which is quite an accomplishment. He flew the KC-135, the RB-57F, the U-2, and that's quite a challenge to fly, I'll tell you, the F-104 and the SR-71. And uh, he had about a 1,000 hours combat time in the C-130 in uh, Vietnam. So he's got quite a um, quite a broad spectrum and uh, background in flying because uh, you know you don't get chosen as a slacker to fly the SR-71. I think that's uh, that's pretty obvious. And flying the C-130 uh, in combat is is quite uh, is quite an accomplishment also. And uh, obviously uh, you've got a lot of experience in flying into short fields, rough fields, unimproved fields under not the uh, best situation and he says basically he figures that's the why why he was chosen to do this mission because of his c-130 uh extensive background and uh, that type of flying but um they weren't terribly fair to him because basically uh they figured well he's qualified he was he was qualified on the 727 and he was just handed this mission and uh told to go do it and uh th there's an interesting story about that but let me tell you first a bit about uh, a naive first lieutenant who went out to edwards and uh, i'm uh, flying a uh, o2 out there now this is this is cessna's great uh great uh, military aircraft you're probably not familiar with his highly secret program the suck and blow program but i'm flying an o2 and i'm flying with an air force test pilot and he comes in around and he prangs the landing and i go what was that and he goes well i pranged the landing and i go you're a test pilot i thought test pilots never made a bad landing in their life and he goes well you're delusional so that that brought me uh, to a little bit under better understanding of the realities of being a test pilot and a lot of times Test pilots are thrown into very, um, let's let's call them trying situations. A lot of the life of the test pilot is you do something for the first time. They do a lot of firsts. And, uh, you know, whether it's a, a certain type of test mission you're doing or he was handed this mission to fly the 727. Now, now I talked to BC and uh, it was very interesting. He um, had never done a flaps 40 landing before and i kind of wonder about uh you know what kind of a checkout did he get in flying the 27 obviously it's kind of like checkouts that test pilots get they can be very brief very fire hose and okay you're qualified you, you we did a couple patterns and you're qualified and he'd never done a flaps 40 before now uh he actually referred to the flaps 40 as a uh, flaps full landing well 27 pilots don't refer to it as a full flaps landing. They call it a flaps 40 landing because there's a special thing about a flaps 40 landing because a flaps 40 landing can really bite you in the posterior. Now, when I was a line check airman, you know, we did all the flap takeoff settings. We did all the flap landing settings and the flap 40 se setting was especially interesting. Now, back in uh, 19... 1993 for Flying Magazine, there was a guy named uh, Lee Morgan, and he wrote an article uh, that titled Greasers when landing a 727, not likely. So I would hand this little handout to my students and say, you know, right here, if anybody says you didn't get a good landing, boy, it's written in the magazine that uh, that's, that's virtually impossible. So I said, you got an out. Well, uh, 
you can get a nice landing in the 727. We typically did a check and roll thing. The way the gear and the CG is located, you'd come in, you'd uh, check the uh, the descent rate by coming back on the yoke, and then you'd push forward it. So as you push forward on the yoke, so as you're coming down, the main gear is coming up, and you get a nice touchdown. Now, if you had a little extra speed on a flaps 30, you you could also uh, pull the power and do a normal flare. But as I mentioned uh, to John Cashman, a little discussion. Uh, John Cashman was chief test pilot on the triple seven when I flew with him. And uh, I said, yeah, you can you can flare the 27 just like a regular airplane, get a nice landing. And he just looked at me and says, where's your touchdown point? Because you're going to extend it because you're chewing up a lot of uh, uh, time and distance down the runway as you're you're going for that greaser where if you do a check in the flare, you, you know, check and roll, you put the thing right on the spot fairly well and you get a good landing. Now, flaps 40 landings are a different animal. Uh, there's two rules on the basic flaps 40 landing is you don't get slow and you don't pull the power early. And, and I've done a lot of these, but you know, with the noise abatement thing, we kind of got away from them uh, unless it was an emergency. And I at times declared a sound emergency going into a very snowy uh, airfield, uh, like in Albany, New York, I think one time it was just snowing like heck. And the runway uh, braking action was not the best in the world, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, so I did flaps 40 and got a, a very nice landing, nice compliments, because you can get a nice smooth landing, but you don't get slow. Now, um, BC had never done a flaps 40 landing. And, and I think, you know, you, you kind of got to be kidding. Well, part of the thing he said, you know, was he was handed this mission and told, take this airplane, fly it to uh, Miggs field and land it. So they, they checked with engineering and made sure that, yeah, you, you can, uh, you know, stop on that runway. It's a 3000 foot runway and his landing was good because he stopped in 2000 feet. Now it came in, uh, he, he took 10 knots off, which, eh, not a good idea. Uh, the winds were, uh, the winds were gusty. Uh, he had about a 15 knot gusty crosswind from the left, which is coming across the buildings and stuff and you get turbulence and that's not great. But when you take that 10 knots off and you, you can see it there because the airplane, uh, in the last little bit of the video, and I'll, I'll tag the whole video on at the end because it's really cool because the video, uh, shows, um, a lot of the old broadcasters in the Chicago area, if you're from the Chicago area and I'm digressing here, if you're from the Chicago area, you'll recognize a lot of these guys, uh, Tom Tilden and stuff like that. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're just, uh, people who, uh, who, who, uh, um, uh, Tilden was, uh, American airlines pilot and, uh, he was a weather reporter. So it was, uh, it was kind of cool. And he does a, a little comment on the, uh, the 727 in there. But, uh, BC told me that he was handed this and I said, well, why didn't you practice? And he goes, well, you know, we, we didn't think about that, <laughs> you know, uh, probably didn't have an opportunity. These guys are fairly busy. They do all the weird flights that, uh, line pilots don't want to do and aren't qualified to do. Uh, but so they, they, they go up and, and, and this is the type of flight they do. And, uh, he had not practiced it. Uh, he had 12,000 pounds extra fuel on board. And of course, when you want to land short, extra weight is not your friend. So, um, you want to get rid of that. Uh, uh, why he didn't have it defueled before, I don't know, because once it gets to MIGS, they're going to have to defuel it anyway. Um, he could have saved himself a little bit of trouble, but, you know, putting this thing uh, to a stop in 2,000 feet is is doing pretty well. But the, the, the kiss of death was, um, you know, being 10 knots slow and uh, pulling the power early because it, it'll just drop out of the sky for you. Now, now I've come in, flaps 40 in gusty conditions, and it tends, it tends to wallow a little bit, but um, the... the the, uh, on, on one case, the, uh, the wind kind of died on me and I actually pulled the power early on flaps 40, which is just something you just don't want to do, uh, because it can get you into all sorts of, uh, trouble and you'll fall out of the sky, but I still got a good landing on it. So basically that's the thing, uh, you know, it, it would have been nice if, if he would have practiced it. Uh, he didn't, ex he didn't know that there was going to be all these cameras and that it was a big deal. He thought he was just taking the airplane from, uh, out, uh, in San Francisco and he was just going to land it at Megs and that was going to be it. And, uh, didn't realize it was going to be a big media event, unfortunately.
All right, so the 727 gets delivered to Chicago. They put it on a barge, take it, uh, I think, in Indiana someplace where they do a little bit of restoration on it. And they take out a wall in the uh, uh, Science and Industry Museum, and they uh, they put the airplane in there and uh, uh, do a, a very nice uh, display. And uh, we've got a lot of old retired United pilots who will come and stand by it and uh, tell the people all sorts of good things about the 727. Now, shortly before this aircraft, was going to go into the museum. It was in line service, and I flew it about two weeks before it's going to go in the museum. And I thought, well, it'd be nice to make a little announcement to the people that, hey, you're flying a museum piece. Then as I kind of said those words in my head, I go, you know, saying you're flying a museum piece probably isn't the uh, the, the, the thing that will make people uh, feel nice, warm, fuzzy, and confident. So I, I, I kind of left that part out. But Anyway, um, I want to make a mention about the quality of test pilot that we have at United Airlines. It's a very selective process. Graduate of a uh, of a recognized test pilot school, a lot of experience. Uh, I know a lot of the test pilots, and they are extremely uh, qualified individuals. One of them, uh, actually, I've known uh, since uh, out at Edwards. Uh, we were both squadron pilots out there in the late 70s, and he is a uh, uh, one of the uh, test pilots for United Airlines. He, he's retired, though, now. Uh, he's an old codger like me. Um, I won best paper, uh, best technical paper of the year uh, in the side experimental test pilots in 1999. He won it in 2000 for a paper on uh, SR-71 inlet uh, uh, dynamics equations, stuff like that. And I told him that we needed to let somebody else, um, uh, Tom Tilden, uh, we needed to let somebody else win this award other than a United person. But anyway, I digress. Now, the one thing interesting about this is these guys do a lot of things that line pilots would not want to do or not be qualified to do. And uh, there's a guy I know locally who, who told me that uh, he was a test pilot for their major airline. And I go, really? I didn't know you were an SCTP uh, member because I'd known this guy for a while. And he goes, what? And I go, Society of Experimental Test Pilots, if you know, if you are somebody who calls yourself a test pilot, you either are a member of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots, SCTP, or you at least know what it is. So um, I was a little surprised that he was doing kind of flight test work because you that's one of those things you can get yourself into trouble. You need the qualification, the background, uh, the experience. So I was kind of scratching my head on that. And our guys got it. Uh, just a bunch of really cool, qualified people, and they do the things that uh, people don't want to do, um, uh, like three-engine ferries on the uh, the uh, 747. Uh, one time I mentioned about doing a three-engine ferry on the 27, and I do that all the time, and uh, in, in, I digress here. In training, uh, I'd been flying the uh, the 727, uh, 737 as captain, and I went to the 27, and in training they said, okay, we're going to do some two-engine approaches, and I said, great, I've been doing those for a year and a half. Anyway, I digress. Now, uh, let's watch the video. Oh, and by the way, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, found it interesting and informative. And uh, you can watch the, uh, the whole video here I've tagged on to the end. Thanks for watching. Now, live from the NBC Tower, this is the Channel 5 News at 5. It's less than 30 years old, and it's already a museum relic. Today, a 727 jet made its final landing en route to retirement at the Museum of Science and Industry. But it was a landing that had never been tried before. Channel 5 aviation reporter Jim Tillman tells us how it was done. First, you find the right pilot, one like Captain B.C. Thomas, test pilot, United Airlines. You pick a beautiful fall day, you invite the public, the press, and just to be safe, crash rescue teams. It's the final flight for this proud bird, so why not take a look-see, a low pass. And finally, it's time to lower the flaps and the landing gear for the last time. It's a super short runway, about half as long as O'Hare's shortest jet runways. So, Captain Thomas, what did you do to practice for this? <laughs> I didn't practice for it. You didn't actually go out and fly this particular airplane for... Well, I, I am current in the 727, but as yeah. far as making short field landings, no, we don't, we don't practice that. The winds at Meg's can be very tricky. Today, they were only about 12 miles an hour, but gusty. Captain Thomas makes minor adjustments for the wind. He slows the airplane down to a crawl, about 115 miles an hour. 
He later says he was aiming to land about 50 feet from the approach edge of the runway. For thousands and thousands of people who will visit the Museum of Science and Industry in the days to come, they will see this as just another relic of a time gone by. But those of us who have flown airplanes just like this one, it will be a dream come true. Jim Tillman, Channel 5 News. Plane's journey isn't done yet. On Thursday, they load it on a barge and then ship it down to Burns Harbor in Indiana for final preparation before it goes on display at the Museum of Science and Industry in the fall of 1994. This is Eyewitness News with John Drury and Diane Burns, Steve Deschler with weather, Jim Rose on sports, and the Eyewitness News team. All right, Floyd, thank you. Well, Miggs Field, as you probably know, is Chicago's little airport on the lakefront. But today, according to our Frank Matthey, Miggs' one short runway received a very big test. The curious were lined up at Miggs Field waiting. The fire trucks were put on alert just in case of emergency. And then the United commercial jet came in for a flyby along Big Runway. It's unusual because planes this size are not supposed to land here. Yes, that was a 727, the plan to land at Meeks Field, a big plane at a small airport. But this is a special plane with a special destination, destination history. The 28-year-old airliner is being donated by United Airlines to the Museum of Science and Industry. It's a model that changed the entire airline business. It was the first truly successful commercial jet airplane. And for quite a few years. Many years, almost 30 years. And that's why the plane is going to the Museum of Science and Industry, and that's why it has to land here. The long plane on a short runway, on a windy day. But pilot B.C. Thomas does it, and with plenty of runway to spare. The uh, wind off of the buildings and the, the water land contrast, I think, caused a lot of, uh, a lot of turbulence. But it, 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 it wasn't that bad. Would you like to take this thing off from here? It would be possible, but uh, it, you'd have to uh, probably chain it down at the end of the runway and go to full power and then cut the chain. <laughs> this coming Thursday, the 727 will be loaded onto a barge and taken to Benton Harbor, Michigan for modification. Then next fall, it will be barged back to Chicago and hauled across Lakeshore Drive to the Museum of Science and Industry for what should be an interesting landing inside. Inside the museum, it will be along the first balcony, which as you remember is at the long axis on the first balcony. So this 727 has flown for the last time, but in two years it will take off again as a new exhibit. Frank Matthey, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. <laughs> Might be easier to move move the museum, probably. Yeah, I, would think so. I wouldn't want to be on that plane as it took off from Midfield, I don't think. This is Chicago's Midday News. You were driving on Lakeshore Drive at around 10 o'clock this morning. You weren't hallucinating. That was a United Airlines 727 landing at Mix Field, normally the domain of private aircraft. But it isn't really a United Jet anymore. It's about to become a museum relic. Joni explains. The Boeing 727-100 made a flyby about 100 feet off the lakeshore. Very close, like a military maneuver, nothing like we're used to seeing from a large commercial plane. Then it veered sharply toward the lake to prepare for approach. When the pilot steered the jet toward the tiny runway of Miggs Field, it wobbled as he fought a stiff crosswind. And yet, he landed it safely with plenty of room to spare. When you're talking about a short field approach, so the idea is to put it on the end of the runway. And uh, you don't want to hurt anything, but you want to put it on rather firm and, and get on the brakes and reverse and the uh, speed brakes immediately. It was an unusual assignment for the pilot. And of course, we work for United Airlines. United Airlines is not in the business of letting us have fun. We fly airplanes for a serious uh, job. Uh, so it's very rare that we get to make a flyby. In fact, this is the first one I've ever made in, in, in a 727. The daring landing ushers in a new era for the Museum of Science and Industry's transportation exhibit. Uh, lots of people fly, but many people have never seen a plane this close, have never been in a plane, and really don't understand why it stays up in the air. Just think about it. I mean, it's a pretty heavy object. How come it stays in the air? Well, we hope to be able to explain that. 
This plane goes on a barge headed for Indiana for storage and then next year makes another daring voyage across Lakeshore Drive to the museum where they'll have to break down walls to get the thing inside. At Miggs Field, Joni Lum, WGN News. <laughs> well, they couldn't have asked for a nicer day. United got its money's worth out of that plane. It flew from 1964 until last November, carrying more than 3 million passengers, almost 28 million miles. And I wonder what the visibility was out there today, because it certainly looked clear. Oh, this is that beautiful Canadian air, 20-plus miles. Uh, wow. And yet another first for our Science and Industry Museum around right. here, Bob. That's terrific. Where uh, are they going to put that thing? They're going to hang it inside? I you know, they got some know. other planes hanging all around in the ceiling. Kind of interesting to see. They've got the submarine, the mine down there, now a, now a plane. That's pretty good. you got a weather office down there. One <laughs> Maybe one of these days they will, Bob. I'll tell you something. And if you're on Lakeshore Drive today, you might have thought it was Mannheim Road. Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry has a captured Nazi submarine, a coal mine, an Egyptian tomb. Now it will have a 727 jetliner. United Airlines donating this retiring Boeing 727 seen flying into tiny Miggs Field today. It was a tricky landing, as you might expect. Textbook, however, considering there's less than 4,000 feet of runway right here at Miggs. That plane will be on exhibit at the museum next fall. This is Channel 2 News at 6. An historic landing at Miggs Field marks the end and the beginning for a 28-year-old jetliner. The Boeing 727, finding strong crosswinds, became the largest commercial jet ever to land at Miggs. After 28 million miles in the air, this was its last landing. Now the big jet will be loaded aboard a barge and warehoused in Indiana for a year. Then it goes to its last hangar, an enormous exhibit hall at the Museum of Science and Industry. That'll be a nice addition. Well, it's Steve Baskerville looking ahead to Frost. I tell you, one for the record there, one for the record in this direction. That you could...